Thank you for joining us on Creme 2 Plus. I'm Tim Pham. This is your Creme 2 News Recap, where we take a closer look at some of the biggest stories in the Inland Northwest this past week. Keith Van Dyne says no one will be able to fill the shoes of his friend, Scott Eldridge. He turned out to be one of my, uh, or if not my best friend. Van Dyne says his memories of Eldridge include motorcycle road trips down the Oregon coast and driving to watch drag racing in Bakersfield. I always needed somebody to come along to, to talk so that I wouldn't fall asleep and Scott fit that bill very well. Van Dyne says Eldridge was known by his friends and family for his positive energy, but his love for racing is what people could see. His company name that he had was Got to Go Racing and, and that was his whole I got to go racing. I got to go, got to go, got to go. And and so he had this little, his hats were GTGR with the with his car number on him. And, and he, he never went anywhere without it. Van Dyne says Eldridge was always there for him because for Eldridge, he would think of others before himself. Scott was everywhere um, in the respects that if he was in Spokane and you needed something here, and I'm in Vancouver, Washington, so... Uh, it wasn't very long before Scott was here. He had his own agenda that things that he needed to get done, but um, people were more important to him. Van Dyne says he knows in his friend's death, people will remember Eldridge for his good heart and selfless character. You don't need a lifetime to, he was genuine, right? There, there wasn't, a, it wasn't a big cover up. That's who he was. Van Dyne says Eldridge's family is flying in from across the country and world to begin the next steps in honoring his life. He was a son, brother, and father of two. There you go. Is this a baby? Yeah, is that your baby? It started as a busy morning. I know. Tina Stiles woke up to her French bulldog going into labor. And I was in her crate with her getting ready to have a second puppy. The last thing on her mind was an unlocked front door. She had her first puppy at 8, and he came through the door at 8.30. He was an armed robber looking for money. He come in with his hand over his arm, or his arm over his face, kind of covering it, and bent down, and then waving a gun. He says, I was told that you have money in the safe. And pulled me out of the dog crate, made me go into the living room and lay down put my hands behind my back. Tina tied up, not knowing what might happen next. And I was scared for real, but um, I was definitely trying to stay calm. And so was her husband next to her in the living room. Telling him, don't hurt her, do not hurt her. And I'm like, I don't have no money. I have no money. I'm on social security, I have no money. Deputies say 44 year old Brian Gorder got into the safe, but didn't find any money just some papers, so he took the couple's phones. I'm pretty calm, I, I didn't freak out until after he left. Tina called 911 and got back to what she had been doing. Come here. Her dog was still in labor. So it was a long time for her to, to go through all of that. Three of the five puppies survived. Tina believes they all would have lived had there not been so many interruptions that morning. That's a good girl. She still has a lot of questions. I would really like to know who sent him to my house. But she knows the reason she came out okay. Keeping a level head is, is how you survive in this world. And before Gorder was arrested, deputies say he broke into another woman's home nearby. He's being held on a $100,000 bond. The Spokane City Council approved a $1.6 million contract last night for revived counseling. They're a behavioral support organization that's been in Spokane since 2017. Revive Counseling will operate what's called wraparound services, serving behavioral and social needs. They were the only organization to submit a proposal to offer these services. Staff with Revive Counseling is already working at Camp Hope with the goal of moving people to the trend shelter. Every single person in, at Revive in our office comes from some background of lived experience. So we know that sense of desperation of getting out of your situation. Um, and we're able to have the opportunity to not only work for the people, but walk alongside them as they figure their lives out. With the funds, Revive Counseling hopes to help people find jobs and transition out of homelessness. They also focus on mental health counseling and addiction treatment.
My ultimate vision with this project is to reduce the recidivism of people going back into homelessness um, and eventually reach functional zero. And by having dedicated staff there all the time, we will be able to meet that goal. In Revive Counseling's proposal to the city, their goal is to get 50% of their clients into long-term transitional housing. But with the amount of resources they have, they say this could take up to two years. Revive Counseling said their mission is to serve people's best interests. I tell a lot of the folks that I serve that they're, they're really um, in charge of where their situation goes. Um, that is the most important piece about working with this population is that they know that everything they do is supported by us. Revive Counseling says that they won't force people who live at Camp Hope to move into the shelter, but they will still give those people other support options if they choose to take it. So Revive Counseling says they have not signed the contract yet, but they hope to be fully operational at this shelter by the first week of November. At one point during the last several months, Jules Helping Hand says there were upwards of 689 people living in this single city block. Over the last four weeks, 349 campers have left and moved into housing and shelters. The camp had 449 residents as of this Saturday. There will be no new guests only a decrease in number of people there from here on out. Julie Garcia of Jules Helping Hand says it'll take time, more time than the sheriff is giving them to clear everyone out. We don't have enough space yet created for these folks to go. There is not enough beds in our shelter system. That's what she said at tonight's East Central Neighborhood Council meeting where members passed the resolution calling for the camp to empty out no later than Thanksgiving. I would be extremely concerned if there was this hard deadline and there are not, you know, there are not options and solutions in place. Garcia warned that homeless people don't just disappear. If law enforcement removes them during the second week in November, people will start to camp in parks and neighborhoods. But developer Larry Stone, who owns and leases the Trent shelter to the city, says there are enough beds available and ready throughout the entire shelter system. The time has come. Uh, the, the city has notified uh, the state that they have plenty of spots at um, the Trent facility and several other facilities. Uh, Union Gospel Mission has notified that they have 54 spots available. When I add those up, it far exceeds the population at Camp Hope. In a statement to Krem 2, city spokesperson Brian Coddington said in part, individuals' belongings can be stored on site and they can sleep in a bed and eat regular meals in a safer, healthier, more humane environment while maintaining the same ability to connect to permanent housing. That opportunity is available to everyone at Camp Hope. And as we've reported, Sheriff Ozzie Knezovich has already agreed to extend the camp's deadline at the request of service providers to sometime during the second week of November. The sheriff says people who refuse to leave will be arrested. Spokane Police Chief Craig Meidel has also warned that the property could be declared a nuisance. Corey was uh, larger than life. The saying goes, one of the hardest things in life is to bury a child. Lisa Ward can attest to that. Back in 2018, she lost her son tragically. It was it was horrific. According to police reports, Corey and Logan got into an altercation near Corey's apartment. When officers arrived on the scene, they found Corey lying in the grass. He stabbed him 10 times. Logan had left the scene. Logan proceeded to work. He didn't stop to call 911. He didn't bang on the nearest door to say, I'm afraid for my life. Lisa says learning of her son's death was hard. I just, I remember shouting, you know, is my son alive? And he said that there had been a fatality. And I, not, not in my wildest dreams did I think it was going to be Corey. And then they said his name and I just remember screaming. Corey was pronounced dead on the scene. Police later arrested Logan and he told police he acted in self-defense. We only have um, Logan's side of the story and I'm not sure that that is the truth. Maybe it's Logan's truth, but I'm not sure it's what really happened. Crime 2 News team reached out to the prosecuting attorney's office. According to Chief Criminal Prosecuting Attorney Larry Steinmetz, he says that Ward admitted to hitting Clegg and the evidence showed self-defense. But Corey's mom says that she was told by prosecutors that they didn't want to move forward with the case because they didn't think they could win. As far as her son's memory, she says it lives on through his daughter. The day before Corey was 
killed, he took a paternity test and it, uh, the paternity test came back that he was the father of a child and unfortunately her mom died in July of 2021 and then we adopted her. So we are raising um, Natalie and uh, she is just, just like her dad. <laughs> In Spokane, Malia Kamal, Creme 2 News. Zany's Smoke Shop. How are you? Has some crazy off the wall stuff. We've got everything ranging from uh, body detox products, rolling papers, scales, grinders, obviously all the glass. Never know what, what you're going to get at Zany's. Manager Ben Osborne wants Zany's to be a hometown shop to the Emerson Garfield neighborhood. Zany's has always been exactly what it is now. It's uh, it's open to everybody. It's a it's a hippie shop. But he says the crime in this neighborhood makes it difficult to maintain that experience for customers. Somebody uh, decided to take a crowbar to the pop machine and try to get the money out of it. It's completely peeled back, um, ripped apart from the rivets here. Um, but as far as functioning, it works just fine. Amidst the vandalism, the drugs and shootings near here, Ben hopes for a better, safer community. The problem has become so enormous that I don't really know where they, where they can start as far as fixing it. One of the things I've really noticed is just this increase in tension. Spokane Police Chief Craig Meidel says an increase in calls and officer fatigue are the results of this trend. And that's why the department wants to restructure its precincts and patrols. That means moving some of its current officers from other units to patrolling the streets. The hope is starting January we will see about 40 more officers on patrol than what we currently have as well. This is one of many layers that, that we are, are looking at to fix the crime issue that we have in Spokane. We're gonna go cash your card. Ben welcomes the idea of seeing more officers around. When the presence is there, um, bad guys don't ever wanna see the cops. They're gonna go the opposite direction. He hopes that with this change, the only crazy off the wall stuff he sees are displayed in his shop. There's some zany stickers in there for you too. Thank you so much. Have a zany day. Now is the time for Spokane County's 300,000 plus registered voters to make their voices heard. Spokane County Elections Office tells me 8,000 ballots have already been mailed off and another 175,000 are on their way today. Election day is November 8th, but the Spokane County Elections Office has been preparing for months to make sure voters are ready to cast their ballots. There is not a downtime in elections. We are in election cycle normally 40 weeks out of the year. Those other 12 weeks, we're doing catch up on voter registration information. According to the elections office, most registered voters will receive their ballots over the next two days. Spokane County Auditor Vicki Dalton says voters can look to the state and for the first time this year, the local voters pamphlet for how to be election ready. There's lots of good information about how vote by mail works, what the deadlines are, where to get help, Dalton says her office has high hopes for voter turnout. We're expecting roughly 70% of all voters to return a ballot to us. And if you'd like to be a part of the office's predicted 70% of active voters, Dalton says you have options to make sure your vote is counted. Go put it in one of our bins at the libraries, at city halls. They're very conveniently located. Or you can put it in the mail. But if you put it in the mail, it needs to be postmarked no later than election day. When you choose to drop off your ballot over the next three weeks is up to you. Just make sure it's in the mail by November 8th. Washington State University is removing the COVID-19 vaccine mandate for employers, contractors, and volunteers. But some students are wondering why it wasn't removed for them. The university says they lifted the vaccine mandate because of recent COVID-19 rates and the vaccine success. There are some exceptions. Staff and faculty who work in healthcare and other facilities will still be required to get a vaccine. The university says because of how low rates are now, there won't be much change. This is not going to be a, a really a big deal. You know, I think I said I think it's just one piece of documentation, one less piece of documentation uh, a new employee has to provide before they get hired. So um, I. I don't think it's going to be a big deal. Washington State has yet to lift the mandate for students. They say the reason they haven't yet 
is because there are over 4,000 students that live in close quarters with each other, unlike staff and faculty who only come to campus for the day. One student still says the vaccine should be required for everyone. It makes me feel like a little terrified because like we still have COVID in our lives and I feel like we're moving it. Even though like they leave and stuff like you were saying, it's just like we can still all get it. Many people have already gotten it already from being in class. Vaccination was required for students to attend classes this year. But with the recent change, some students think the school is treating them unfairly. For uh, students are required to actually take the vaccines, I think it's pretty unfair. You should have an option, especially if you're giving faculty and staff an option, because um, WSU is paying them but we're paying WSU. The mandate will be lifted by the end of the month, but the university says there is always a possibility it could return if COVID gets worse. The university says that they'll keep the vaccine mandate for all its students through the end of this academic year, but they'll revisit it before next fall. The expansion of Spokane International Airport is currently underway. Ian O'Neill is a frequent flyer. He flies out of Spokane several times a month for work. Currently, I think that it needs uh, an expansion, which obviously is happening right now. Uh, the lines are getting a little bit longer. Uh, there's more people moving to the area. So I think that uh, this, uh, this expansion is well needed, a little bit overdue. O'Neill says he would love to see the expansion include more amenities, such as bigger bathrooms and more seating. Currently, the Concourse C expansion project is the first phase of the Terminal Renovations and Expansion Program. The $150 million expansion will add three new gates, replace current ground boarding gates with three passenger loading bridges, modernize existing gates, and add six ticket counter locations for airlines to use. It is expected to be completed in 2025. I think it could be good or bad. That's Kelsey Cooper, an airport employee. She says the expansion could mean more business and more jobs. Or it could do the complete opposite and we could be more shorthanded than we already are, which would cause issues for every other department, which makes a whole functionality thing a big issue. Today, O'Neill had to park in an overflow parking and wait for a shuttle to take him to the checkout counter. And that wasn't the only wait. He had to wait in this line. Expanding flights mean fewer layovers. And that's one thing O'Neill is happy about. Yeah, one thing I, I do not like are layovers. That's when things can happen. Uh, if there are more direct flights to the final destination, then, then there'll be less headache down the road. The East Central Community Meeting was the last of four community meetings to discuss potential locations for this new dog park. Neighbors here in the East Central area say they would not be happy if the Underhill Park location was chosen. We're going to do everything we can to try to change their mind. And this community is going to be in an uproar if they choose Underhill. So if the city chooses Underhill, the plan would be to fence off seven acres of the park's natural area. But people living by the park say it's not even safe for a dog park. There are rocks and bluffs that could be dangerous. The two other potential spots are Lincoln Park and Hazel's Creek Park. But a lot of neighbors in both those areas are also concerned about having a dog park there. The city says at this point all of these are just discussions and they have not chosen an official spot for the new South Hill, South Hill Dog Park quite yet. Spokane Valley police believe 20 year old Aaron McAteer stabbed and killed his cousin in Spokane Valley Friday evening. Police arrested him a day later. Now the suspect claims he was acting in self defense, but investigators say witness statements and surveillance video contradict his story. When Spokane Valley police responded to East Boone Friday evening, they found a man dead in the bushes and covered in blood. They searched for the suspect, who was seen walking down Boone Avenue in this surveillance video. Investigators believe this video captures the suspect prior to the altercation that witnesses later reported. One of those witnesses, who asked to remain anonymous, shared with us what she saw. My wife said that she saw a lot of blood, so then that's when we went inside and called 911. Um, and then we went to go check while I was on the phone with 911 and we saw the guy that we originally saw walking laying in the bushes lifeless. The day after the stabbing, 20-year-old Aaron McAteer turned himself in. 
Spokane County Court documents say McAteer was drinking with his cousin at his grandma's house Friday afternoon. Then they walked together to 7-Eleven when the suspect says his cousin started to walk off. McAteer told investigators he called out to his cousin from a block away. Then he says his cousin started running at him with a pocket knife and cut the suspect's hand. McAteer eventually pulled out his own pocket knife. He admitted to stabbing his cousin two to three times and saw him fall into the bushes. However, investigators say they found no injuries on the suspect that are consistent with being assaulted. And they say no evidence from the scene supports his claims of acting in self-defense. McAteer confessed to his grandmother he stabbed his cousin and then turned himself in. Hours before Jeffrey Smith was killed in a SWAT team shootout in these woods outside of Loon Lake, court documents show he went to a man's home in Deer Park, pointed a gun at his head, and threatened to kill him. Deputies were called to that home last Wednesday around 3.15 in the afternoon. The man said he came home to find Smith on his porch and didn't recognize him at first, but then realized he committed a sex crime against a young girl Smith knew. He told deputies Smith pointed a handgun at his face and said, quote, I am here to kill you. The man told deputies he closed his eyes, believing he was about to die. Then Smith fired a shot past his head and into the ground. Smith eventually drove off wearing a bulletproof vest. Court documents show he went to a friend's house near Loon Lake and said he just shot someone in the head. Another person at the house called 911, and when deputies showed up, they saw Smith with the gun walking into the woods, refusing to stop. The sheriff's SWAT team responded along with a drone. Deputies could hear Smith firing off rounds in the woods. He was later shot and killed. Today, the sheriff's office identified the deputies involved as Deputy Stephen Blackman and Deputy Alex Bullion. They have been placed on administrative leave, which is standard protocol as the Spokane Police Department investigates the shooting. Rachel Gano and her husband opened Fluffy's Candy Store in North Spokane as a fun business venture. We were sitting in church one day and literally the sermon was, are you not doing something because you're afraid? So that's how it started. We just wanted to create a fun place for people to come. But early September, the couple reported their business founded on fun had been burglarized. They had thrown a large rock, probably a good 10 pound rock through the bottom half of one of our windows. So it just shattered it. They probably unlocked the door and helped themselves so they came in. Gano says the burglar stole her cash box and caused thousands of dollars worth of damage. But she says money isn't what she's most upset about losing. We also own a donut shop and we have seven children. So we are constantly running. So it's not so much the money, it's the time involved. It's the time in talking with the police officers, having to be closed, having your windows boarded up, and just the comments, the questions. It really is, that is the, the heartache for us. One month later, Another business, just a few doors down on Holland Avenue, reported a burglary too. Spokane police say nine similar burglaries have been reported since August 1st in the area. Gano says she believes the increase of crime in her neighborhood could be linked to Spokane's population growth. I don't believe it's common, but I think it's becoming more common. Just the influx of new residents and just people to Spokane in general. But despite the heartache she says she felt in the moment, she's able to reflect on the situation with a positive outlook. I mean, it makes you angry that people do that, but it's what are you going to do? It's out of your control after that point. It's you can handle your own reaction to it, but not theirs. SPD says it's working with Fluffies on finding any involved suspects. We reached out to Spokane Police with more questions on the reported activity in this area. Julie Humphreys with the department says police are aware of these cases and at least one arrest has been made. She says police are actively investigating other cases. The only thing certain is death and taxes, and taxes are going to go up every year. Also, Spokane County Assessor Tom Conis says that homeowners in Spokane County could pay as much as 9% more in property taxes come next year. The reason behind this is the fact that property values have increased by 30%, but that solely won't be passed along to property owners through tax assessments. Instead, some of that money will be voted on and potentially raised through levies and other measures. Right now, we're looking at 8% inflation nationwide, and yet the municipalities are limited to 1%, which is great for us as taxpayers because it, it makes it a little more solid. This year, we had, of course, unprecedented value increases. A uh, little over 30% countywide. Uh, we are estimating probably about a 9% total tax increase. So there's not a direct correlation. If your value went up 30%, your taxes aren't, are not going to go up 30%. They can't. 
And as Kona says, municipalities are limited to a 1% increase. The Spokane City Council was originally proposing a 0% increase for the upcoming year. But come next week, the committee will push for a 1% tax increase. Council member Michael Cathcart is against the increase and in the statement explains why. The Spokane City Council proposal to increase taxes across Spokane is misguided during this time of inflation and looming recession. I continue to hear from families and individuals across Spokane who are struggling to afford a rising cost of living, including just making rent or mortgage payments. Now, City Council is expected to vote next Monday on the increase. Property taxes are due in April and October of next year. Right here, seven months ago, Mayor Nadine Woodward held a press conference to bring in the start of an $80 million construction season. And in that presser, she also announced the beginning of the Riverside Construction Project. Now, that project has moved into its final phase. It's been a summer of change for Riverside Avenue. Drivers and pedestrians have had to navigate new traffic changes, detours, and of course, noise. When it first started, it was just unbearable. But the light at the end of the tunnel is near when it comes to Riverside construction. This week, construction moved into its third phase, focusing work between Stevens and Wall. It's exciting to see some of those pieces start to come together. This is a, a, a project that's going to really connect east-west in our community and do a nice job of adding additional options for people to be able to utilize mass transit and to be able to connect to where they're going. But even though this phase marks the end of the project, downtown residents and travelers say construction pain is all the same. It's like every way you try to come downtown or go through downtown, you go to the next arterial and that is also closed. Pretty slow and inconvenient. They glide every, block, every street blocked off at the same time. So it is what it is. Others say construction season can be challenging but they understand it's necessary for progress. I'm glad to see it. I'm glad to see the results already. It's smooth, you know, progress. And the city believes in progress too. In a press release from communications manager Kirsten Davis, she says this construction will add to the vitality of downtown, benefiting visitors, businesses, entertainment, and residents. City spokesperson Brian Coddington says construction is expected to go into November. And in the meantime, drivers and pedestrians are encouraged to continue to be patient and pay attention to road signs. So Dory Whitford is the Lilac Blooms Day Association president. She said in a statement yesterday, the organization is about more than just one person. She said this, quote, the current board is working well together and is looking forward to a great Blooms Day 2023 that Spokane can be proud of. John Neal said he was leaving the Blooms Day organization last week. He had been with Blooms Day for almost 20 years and had been race director since 2019. He said he was leaving after Blooms Day told him he wouldn't be race director anymore and two other board members resigned. We asked President Whitford for comment on the two board members who left. She said they would not comment on employment issues. But in her statement, she did say this, quote, all of us at Bloomsday would like to thank John Neal for his service. We accept his resignation and wish him the absolute best in his future. For now, Neal says he does not have future plans. He says he had been planning on staying with Bloomsday until this sudden change. Three, two, one. Let's go, everyone! Have fun! I think this is really cool. Like, really cool. Oh, we're FaceTiming with Lu Lucas! Everybody loves a dinosaur. It's like kind of universal for children. Right. Yep, everyone loves dinosaurs. They're the best. Talk to me about why you're here today, what, what, who you're collecting books for. I have a great-grandson that's eight years old, and I'm here for him. What do you think of Peppa Pig? I like it. Yeah? What do you think about reading in general? A scale of 1 to 10, a 10 out of 10. Did you get a book? Can you show me the book? Oh, do you, do you think it'll be a good one? Yes. My son loves to read, so I just was really thankful. I thought, okay, we'll just go hang out and get a new book. <laughs> I mean, it helps people out, and it's access to books maybe that you not, some people might not be able to get, you know. Right. Dusty, what are you doing here today? I'm getting books. Well, how do you feel about books? What do you like about them? I like to read them and I like the pictures. Thank you, Destiny. Destiny. Look what we have for you. <laughs> yes. 
thank you for joining us here on Krem2 Plus for a look at some of the biggest news stories of the past week in Spokane and the rest of the Inland Northwest. For the most up-to-date news throughout the weekend, you can watch our very latest newscast right here on Krem2 Plus. Just look for them in the bottom navigation menu. I'm Tim Pham. Thanks for watching.